Now, at the engineering firm where I work, there's people called program managers. A program manager is a person who's responsible for a certain customer and the product line associated with that customer and the uh, engineering and the costs. He has to keep this program on track and keep it making money. Well, just recently, I had a spirited discussion with one of these program managers. Some of the engineers and I were working with a new technology, and we had an innovation. And I wanted to get this innovation inserted on the program. The program manager had some concerns, and he was very concerned about the costs and what they had already invested in it. I assured him that we had worked out all the risky parts, and with just a small investment, this was going to take him into the future. But he kept on about the costs that they invested and how much they wanted to reuse what they already had. We went back and forth a couple times and quickly I became convinced that we were in a territory sometimes called the sunk cost fallacy. I've also heard it called the Concord fallacy. It got the name Concord fallacy from the Concord aircraft. That was a supersonic aircraft that went across the Atlantic. And the French government and the British government invested huge amounts of money in the Concorde long after that airplane had become an economic train wreck. Now here's what the, the sunk cost fallacy is. When a person or group has invested a lot or sacrificed a lot for some cause or some project, very often, they become irrationally dedicated to that project. The reason this is a fallacy is because it's never logical to consider the costs that you've already spent as long as they're not recoverable. That's what makes them a sunk cost. It's, it's very appropriate to think about your future costs. You want to consider what resources you're going to gain from spending money or investing money. But if you've got money sunk that you can't regain, the only thing to consider is the resources you've gained from spending that money. That money is, or that investment is no longer a rational consideration. Now, psychologists have a way of looking at this. They do a thought experiment. Suppose that you bought a non-refundable ticket a very expensive ticket to some sporting event or show. Now the day of the show comes and let's say it's uh, horrible weather and you know you're gonna have a miserable time. It's pouring down raining or there's a blizzard and it's an outdoor concert or game. Would you go to the game? Well, if you're like most people, you would go to the game. Most people use reasoning that goes something like this. I spent $100 on this ticket. If I don't go to the game, I've wasted that money. But this isn't really rational thinking. I mean, look at it this way. You've got two choices. Either you can decide to go to the game, which means you've spent $100 and you're going to have a miserable evening, or you can decide to do something else, in which case you've spent $100 but you might have a perfectly good evening doing something you'd actually enjoy. When you look at it this way, you can see why this is such a fallacy. Consider Intel Corporation. In the 1980s, early in the 80s, they were making money hand over fist on memory chips. In fact, out in Silicon Valley, there were a lot of memory chip companies. But Japanese competition set in and most of the memory companies were going out of business. They couldn't compete. Intel hung in a little longer than most, but they had a lot of discussions about what to do about this. The two co-founders of the company, Gordon Moore and Andy Grove, had, uh, had 
excuse me, Andy Grove and Gordon Moore, yes, they had um, ongoing discussions. And the way the story goes, Grove went into Moore's office and he said to him, what if this company were taken over by somebody else? What if they got rid of us? What would the new um, CEO of the company do? And Moore said, well, they'd probably get out of the memory business. Well, Grove said to him, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we get out of the memory business? What Grove recognized was that they were in the midst of the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost fallacy is the thing that keeps people sometimes arguing about something long after it's become obvious to everybody around that they're losing the argument. In fact, sometimes it's become obvious to the person who's losing the argument that they're losing, and they still hang in there arguing. It's the sunk cost fallacy. Now, tragically, when I was in high school, the, Vi the Vietnam War was taking place, and I heard some fallacious reasoning going on about the, the war. Now, I wasn't sophisticated enough back then to recognize the sunk cost fallacy, but I knew something didn't sit right. Lyndon Johnson and other officials would come on the television and they'd talk about the war effort, but sometimes they'd say something to the effect that a lot of young men have sacrificed their lives in Vietnam. If we are to pull out of the war now, we'd be wasting those lives. Well, come on, this is not, this is not a good way to reason about this. To stay in a war because a lot of young men have wasted their lives is a terrible reason to stay in a war. There might be some very good strategic objectives and some good reasons to continue with a war, but because a lot of people have sacrificed their lives is a terrible reason. That's a fallacy. The only thing to consider is how many more lives we will have to spend and what the objectives are. Now, why am I bringing this up? with respect to engineering and innovation. It's because the sunk cost fallacy is all about innovation. When you're an innovator, you need to come in every day and look at the new technologies. How can I use this new display system or this new microprocessor or this new manufacturing technique even? You can't sit there and consider, oh, I've got so much invested in this. As an innovator, you've got to be ready to just throw that away and follow the new technology. As long as investing in the new technology makes sense, as long as it's going to take you where you want to be in one year or five years or ten years, that's the way to think about technology. That's the way to be an innovator. And you're going to come up against people who are going to be resistant. And you need to be able to recognize when you're in the, the sunk cost fallacy and the resistance is just that, and you have to be able to sell your ideas. So that's why you need to know about this, the sunk cost fallacy, and that's why I wanted to point it out. So thank you for your attention. And please tune in to all the other uh, videos we have here on innovation. This is, uh, this is something that should help you. And um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully this is going to uh, impart some wisdom, and you're going to find it fun too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.